Hey everybody, Josh the RV Nerd from Bishes RV here at my hometown Coldwater, Michigan store with another of these monthly-ish industry update videos. And it's it's kind of funny the way things are either feast or famine. It's like last month, it was a little quieter, not, not any real big news happening in the RV industry, just more of a little general status update. And this month, like, I actually had to edit out some things I want to talk about because I think this is going to be a fairly long video. So instead of me droning on and on about that, I'm going to get myself moving. So these are the general things that we might talk about today. But also, um, I've been chapter marking these longer videos so that you can hop around to, to check out the topic that most specifically interests you. And if you appreciate how we take this information and bring it out to you to help you be a more educated owner and consumer, make sure you hit that subscribe button and catch us as we roll the next one out. But for now, let's get going. We got a lot to talk about. It's like... It's like somebody kinked the garden hose on the RV news front, and then you just let it go, and pfft, all the news came. I'm done. Why am I doing this? All right, first and foremost, uh, I, I think we just got to get this right out of the way. We have to talk about what's going on with this recall relating to these gas grill quick connects, or as I like to call them, either a propane cooker hooker, or in a case like this, when the gas comes out the backside, it's a propanus. So what's going on here? Um, uh, if you remember in my last industry update, I said this was coming. I said it's going to be a very large scale recall um, on the level of the propane regulator recall that went back so many years. Like this is something that is affecting um, over 100,000 units, maybe over 150,000 in total. We don't know the total final number yet because not all manufacturers have made their official announcements. And that little point right there was used um, I'm trying to be as careful and respectful as I can about this, but it was almost used like a fear-mongering point by, by some people to like try to broadcast this information with the goal, as far as I can tell, of getting quick views and not actually helping anyone. And on that note, I want to uh, give a special shout out. Uh, I've done this before, but to uh, uh, Jason and Abby at RV Miles for being real about what this recall is and what it isn't. So if you, if you haven't heard about any of this, I'm sorry. Um, the the supplier of that little brass grill quick connect may have been using bad brass basically and it could be uh it, it could be cracking or it could be cracked already uh upon use and obviously anytime you have a propane thing and a bad fitting that isn't holding uh the gas and you have a leak that's that's a serious concern that's why it's a recall i'm not trying to downplay um, the, the, like, I'm not sure. Say it's not a big deal, guys. No, okay, it's definitely a thing that we want to get taken care of, certainly. But it's not the manufacturers are hiding this from us. No, it, it's just that's not how recalls work. Manufacturers make announcements. Um, you know, when they've verified which of their uh, units may be affected by this, and when they can get uh, supplies out there to, to fix these things. So um, it is a large scale recall. Not all manufacturers have announced this yet. You may have heard me mention the first couple uh, in my industry update series. I'll give Forrest River some credit. They were one of the very first to acknowledge this is happening. We're getting the notices out to our customers. We wanna make sure that they can get this addressed so they don't lose out on their camping season. And on that note, I wanna give you a, uh, let me back up. There's more manufacturers still to come. Like if uh, I try to also put out about a monthly recall report, you're going to hear this one over probably the next couple months over and over the same thing, the same thing. But the thing is like a couple people I've seen say, well, uh, brand X is using this bad thing and brand Y uses this junk component. It's, it's a supplier based thing that affects frankly more manufacturers uh, than it doesn't, whether it's towable, whether it's motorized, almost anybody with some kind of gas grill quick connect has this unfortunately going on. Um, the thing is, uh, I, I don't know that you necessarily have to like give up your camping season as a result of it. Um, I, I think that there's some easy ways that you can kind of test this. And one of the easiest ways I've ever found to test any sort of propane system, get soapy water. Get like a bottle of soapy water, spray some soapy water on this thing, some sudsy bubbly water, and then turn on your gas bottles on the front of the trailer. And if the propane quick connect starts bubbling around there on its own without you turning on the gas flow, something's wrong. You need to turn that off. You need to have that checked immediately. Um, the uh, You should always, I, I think you should definitely have this checked, but you could also just have the gas grill quick connect removed and plugged because it's the brass fitting. It's not the actual propane lines that's the problem. And then you could go and enjoy your trip. And yeah, maybe you, you don't get to use your gas grill quick connect right away, but that's one little component. Out of all the components on this RV, there's plenty of opportunity for you to still go out there and have a good, safe, fun time. Now, if you spray the soapy water in yours and it's not bubbling, well, then uh, don't 
use it, but you're probably fine. Still though, still make sure you have that uh, checked out and examined by a, uh, a professional at a service center to make sure that this is, uh, you know, you can go camping safely. So yes, it's affecting a large number of units, but it is certainly not the biggest, scariest, like the manufacturers are lying to you kind of recall thing that it's been made out to be. There was, there was some glorification of a very commonplace recall here and I, I don't know, I, I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Hopefully it helps dispel some concerns that some folks might have, and, but also give you a very simple low budget DIY way to check into this. Um, so to shift topics uh, pretty dynamically, um, the model year of RVs is about to change and some have skipped the line and already done that. What that means is, you know, every year it, it be, you know, goes from a 21 to a 22, for instance. Well, last year was one of the first years in a long time Basically, manufacturers all pretty much got together and said, we need to standardize when the model year changes because they were doing these things like, they used to have like an early 2016 and then there would be a late 2016 with changes, but they were both 2016s. But the late 2016 was the same as an early 17 that was different from a late 17 that was the same as an early 2018. And finally, and, and every year the model year kept moving up early, earlier in the year to the tune that I actually saw, um, it was like, it was uh, the calendar year of 2018 in like November, and I saw a 2020 RV get delivered to our dealership. It, they literally skipped an entire year and then some. Well, that kind of, that got uh, sort of kiboshed last year. Um, so how are different manufacturers going to handle the model year change this year? And it's, it, it's really looking like there's not going to be as much standardization and consistency there as I know I would like to see and would make everything easier for everybody else. Um, there are a couple manufacturers who have already kind of jumped the line and pumped out their first 2023 titled things. Wasn't really supposed to happen, but I, I, I don't, it's also been kind of funny this year, very few viewers have asked me, hey, when are the when are the 23s coming out? Normally that's the thing I get hit with every year like crazy. And I think it's because we there was so little in stock. I think we're just, we've just been happy to see something in stock by comparison, you know? Um, but I think you're gonna see different manufacturers handle this differently. I think some are going to make kind of a uh, uh, title year change on their, uh, their, their, well, their titles without actually doing any significant product updates. And I think some manufacturers are gonna wait until they have a specific product update. So I think you'll see the 23 rollout uh, really spread out over the next few months instead of being almost aligned in the sand. Usually June, July is when there's almost a cut off. Well, there's supposed to be a cutoff right now, but I think you're going to see there's a couple manufacturers stepped up and there's a couple that are going to change the model year just so that it sounds like it's newer than it really is, even though it's the exact same camper they've been producing. And I think you're going to see some manufacturers wait till uh, maybe August, October until they can actually change some things out to, uh, to update the model year. Why would they, why would they wait? Why wouldn't they just do those changes now? And the answer to that, folks who didn't ask, is a interesting, complicated kind of balance, knee bone to leg bone relationship between dealer in stock inventories, manufacturer backlogs, and uh, incoming parts uh, supplies to the manufacturers. So, um, where do I start with this? Okay, dealer inventories. It's no secret, uh, their dealer inventories are up, right? Nationally, if you combine the inventory across all dealerships across the nation, inventory is up 43% from what it was. Now, it needed to be because there was a massive inventory deficit out there. We were all ordering out of catalogs, basically. There was often, at many places, very little on hand to take a look at. Not in every place, but in many places. Well, that's obviously not a problem anymore. The thing is, dealerships have two specific limiting factors when it comes to inventory. Physical space and money. Um, I don't know if everyone necessarily realizes we finance this stuff basically just like you. We just finance a whole lot more of them. Um, so a dealership can either run out of space or they can run out of their a line of credit, you know? And uh, at that point, they call the manufacturer and say, hey, you got to, I, I can't take all this stuff. Like you got to start sending it somewhere else, you know? And a lot of dealerships had over ordered for a while just trying to get anything in stock. Now, many dealerships or groups I mentioned previously had kind of wiped their logs 
and and started fresh with what they actually want but not everybody did that so there are some people who still have an entire buffet's worth of inventory coming in when all they need is a dinner plate you know what i mean um so as a result they're telling manufacturers hey whoa 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 you got to slow down so for the first time in several years manufacturers have seen a production reduction <laughs> production reduction what's your function there's something there right maybe i'll ask mr bill if he's still just a bill but uh what i'm getting at here is um some brands not all of them some brands have seen a uh the need to slow down their production a little bit uh, i've seen some manufacturers going down to say like four day a week production there was recently there's a um, amish holiday called a ascension uh, where instead of taking a day off, some manufacturers have taken a whole week off just to kind of give their workers a much deserved uh, break, but also kind of give you know the, the, the market and the system a little more of an opportunity to breathe before continuing to pump more stuff out there. Um, and again, it will vary a little bit from brand to brand, uh, you know, how exactly they've done this, whether they have simply reduced the number of target units they're building or if they have, uh, you know, reduced the number of days that they're producing in a given week. But that leads me to uh, something I've noticed recently that uh, is long overdue. I'm very happy to see and I think everyone's going to be happy to hear about. And that is that the general fit and finish I've seen on a lot of things coming in has improved. I also want to immediately stop right here. What I didn't say was that everything's better. Everything is the best it could be. I want to make it immediately clear. There's still plenty of room for improvement. That wouldn't offend me. It wouldn't offend you. It wouldn't offend my service staff. They've had a hard run of it the last couple of years, and I appreciate every one of those folks back there because that is a that's a tough, tough job. Uh, their job basically exists when things don't go according to plan. That's that takes a toll on a person. I really appreciate the folks that we have back there. Um, what I've seen though is there have been some brands through all of it, through all the thick and the thin and the challenges. There have been like the gold level DSI quality award winners, and I've talked about those in previous videos. And if you're not sure what that is, leave me a little comment. Um, these are there are certain brands that have um, from the people who bought those RVs basically voted and said they this I'm happy I made this purchase it was good they did a good job they took care of me it was a good quality product um, you know so there have been some very good things out there there's also some brands that uh, slipped and there's some brands that need improve needed improvement severely and I'm glad to see that just the general overall fit and finish of things has gotten better still plenty of room for improvement from a lot of brands though I, I don't think we're out of the woods on that uh, area yet um, I, I, I really I want that so badly to be uh, a, a focus for the RV industry um, to, to not rely on uh, an RV dealer to be the final point of uh, fit and finish for for various details but um you know i can wish in one hand and i can crap in the other in the meantime we've got a service department that's doing their best for a lot of folks so if that ain't real i don't know what is again i try to be fair i try to be candid now um so that's that's a positive symptom of the production reduction what's your function despite all this though and despite the fact that uh there are fewer rvs being sold let's talk about this hold on real quick Whew, little scenery change, little costume change. The sun came out for like the first time in I think eight months. I got pleasant weather recording one of these things. Yes! Anyway, I didn't, I don't think you tuned in for a weather report, um, uh, especially since the weather today is probably not in your backyard. Anyway, um, what I'm getting at here, uh, on, the, on the, again, the topic of being fair, transparent, candid. Um, the production reduction thing, that uh, production is outpaced demand. Well, it pretty much goes without saying, but I want it to be said that fewer RVs are being purchased right now than last year. Now, at the same time last year was this uh, incredibly crazy breakneck pace record sales year. So in a way that doesn't surprise me, I, I, it just almost goes without saying that, yeah, that was going to happen. But um, at the same time, um, there's been a little production reduction there's been a uh, you know a, a reduction in sales compared to last year, yet manufacturers' profits are still uh, being reported as like you know at or near record and exceeding expectations. What that makes me hopeful for, and this could be a stupid pipe dream. This is this is just a, a, a hope. This isn't even news, so keep that in mind. I want to make sure I preface that properly. Um, I hope that means manufacturers are operating on margins 
that can be reduced a little bit because I know that our dealer margins have been significantly reduced as we've done everything we could to try to keep things as reasonable as possible for folks. Like you may notice, if you uh, put us to the test, put put any dealership to the test, you'll see that there's not a lot of MSRP sales going on out there and the places that are trying to sell for that kind of money, they ain't selling much right now. Um, so I'm again hopeful that this fall, we start to see the reintroduction for manufacturers of some kind of discount package but there's no guarantee of that. And there's a whole summer of fun to be had here. So I guess it's it's a roll of the dice kind of um, either way. Now, that's all, like I said, this is all big. We're still almost on the same topic, the knee bone to leg bone thing. What is going to happen? When are manufacturers actually going to update their products for the model year? So all of that lead up to this so that you understand how we get to this. The answer is going to be, um, it's gonna be a, a staggered rollout from different manufacturers. Uh, so their manufacturers have to sometimes order parts six, eight, 12 months ahead of time. And that's based off their existing business projections. Well, when you see that production reduction, um, that slows down the amount of RVs that they're building, that slows down the rate at which they're chewing through various pieces and parts, like, like fabrics, you know, like decor related stuff. So as a result, you may see some manufacturers go, you know, we'd really like to change everything uh, right now in June or July, but we might have to wait till August or November until we chew through that extra three or four months of production. Because the fact is, we bought that whole container load of pillows or whatever over there, and we got to get through that stuff. You know, they're not just going to eat that and throw that away and not use it. They're going to go through that stuff. So this year, you may see an interesting stagger between something right now if you look at a 2022 rv right now and then you look at a 23 it might be the same um you might see manufacturers wait until august or something like that to actually call their stuff a 23 when they've chewed through the extra things and you may see a manufacturer make the 23 change now and then do an actual product update later so there might be this little lame duck period in there and i don't have good information on which brand might do what I'm simply trying to prepare you for what you might see when you get online and you start looking at different pieces of inventory in different places. It, it might look a little confusing for a while. Like, wait, that says 23, but it looks like the 22s I've been looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there might be some wacky, goof, stupid stuff going on. We'll see how it goes. That, by the way, is a technical term. And I called it. I called it, I think, almost a year ago. I said there might be a couple new manufacturers coming into the mix. And the first one of those ended up being Ember RV. So that absolutely came to pass. And then I, w I kind of had my ear to the ground and I saw this, uh, this potential new company get zoning basically for a, per uh, a potentially massive production area, a brand new potentially manufacturer. They were sort of going, uh, or sort of known as, they weren't even really going under the name of Legacy RV. Well. It turns out all of that was actually really happening. And I wasn't just crazy in the little tea leaves that I was reading. Um, uh, re recently here, a new company was announced, Brinkley RV. So what can I tell you about them? <laughs> very little, <laughs> which doesn't help you very much. But um, this, uh, these are uh, a group of guys with a lot of years of industry experience. Hey, look at that, it's a Gemini. <laughs> But uh, they, um, you know, a couple of them came from Grand Design. They have a couple different backgrounds here. And um, they, they had been really happy with what they'd accomplished at their previous uh, places. And they wanted to see if there's a way that they could do it better. Now, uh, at this point, uh, it's not expected because they don't even actually even have their facilities built yet, you know. So we're probably six to eight months before we actually physically see the first Brinkley RV. The early indicators on them though, is that what they are trying to do is, uh, they're trying to build a company from the ground up that is going to really focus on the customer service side of things. And I certainly hope that comes to pass. And again, right now it's super early. This company was literally just announced. They don't even have buildings. I don't have specific information I can really relay to you. However, this is something that I'm watching very close. Like someone's going, well, Josh, is Bish just gonna carry Brinkley? I don't know, Brinkley doesn't even have RVs yet, but they will. And when I have more information, 
I will certainly do my best to let you know through updates like this or who knows, maybe in one of my RV video tours if we do end up carrying them. And I don't think it's happening anytime soon, but we might be seeing the early signs of the concept of is the tow vehicle changing? The way that we tow RVs, is the future of it no longer gas or diesel, but is it potentially electric? Or is it even hydrogen fuel cell based? These are some interesting things that are being explored out there in the industry right now. So um, like Tesla has a uh, all electric SUV. There have been some early, uh, you know, pull testing on it recently. I think they were pulling a, a bolus or something like that. Um, which is a, a very lightweight, uh, airstreamish looking thing if you're not familiar with Bolus. But um, what they found is, let's say of, uh, I, I, I'm just gonna make up numbers for easy reference here. Um, let's say that that SUV normally had a charge range, a driving range of like 300 miles. They found that while towing this trailer, they were still able to achieve 71% of that. So that kind of limits you to some short range trips. Um, you know, depending on where you're at in the country, you can't always just map out, hey, where can I find the next Tesla supercharger to hop from one place to the next or anything like that. And uh, a more traditional wall socket charger obviously takes a, a much, much longer time. Um, I don't know, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. For those who weren't aware, that's a thing. Uh, but my point here is there's also evolving tech in RVs. And as these things start to uh, evolve with more solar packages, different charging systems, different batteries, the ability to share power to and from the vehicle, not just take power from the vehicle to charge the RV batteries, but what if the RV going down the road with something like a solar package or anything like that could shunt power forward into the vehicle? We may be able to see uh, an evolution in towing that will keep you away from, uh, you know, filling stops, not gas, but lightning, you know, uh, electricity. It, it could be that the true range uh, of a uh, uh, electric vehicle may actually be unlocked by something like towing an RV. It's a wild, weird thing to think about. What about hydrogen? Well, that is a little more interesting of a question. So that big semi back there, you know, Big trucks run on diesel, right? You know, big motorhomes, the heavy dutiest things they run, like diesel pushers, um, because the, the power that you get out of that engine. That's one of the benefits of a hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the total science math of this, but basically um, the same quantity or, or density or concentration or whatever of, of uh, gas and diesel uh, uh, molecules have about the same potential power output in terms of their kilojoules or whatever you're measuring in or whatever. Um, hydrogen is nearly three times that. It's like 2.8 something or other times. I don't know. It, it's Hydrogen is a very powerful fuel source. Um, so there are limited vehicles out there right now. I think Toyota has some, but um, some big trucks, there are some hydrogen cell powered uh, trucks out there uh, that are you know very capable of moving those big capacity loads very effectively with the power that you get out of those. Um, well, I, I think that this, uh, well, and also another study is kind of looking at sort of projecting the, uh, the trick with hydrogen is the, the cost of a hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen power plant and all that is more than like a uh, diesel. But it is expected that around 2030 or so, which sounds like a long way away, but I guess in the scheme of things, I've been doing this 13 years, maybe isn't that far-fetched. You may see the cost of diesel and hydrogen power systems becoming far more competitive. And what it makes me wonder is, where would you see that first? You know, I don't know that we're necessarily going to see like a lot of hydrogen F-150s, you know, the F-150 H2O or something like that, you know, like the lightning. But um, I think that you could start to see uh, a shakeup in say the diesel pusher market with a hydrogen pusher market. I don't know, we'll see what it ends up being, but it'll be a very interesting thing. I think you'll see it first in those bigger high dollar sort of specialty units that are far less price sensitive and far more feature focused. But by the time my kid grows up in camps, the face and the look of a tow vehicle could be very different. I find that very interesting. I'd be really curious to know, what do you think? Where do you think any of that is going to go? Do you think um, all this electric vehicle stuff is just gonna kinda, it's never really going to take over 
as a primary towing vehicle? Do you think there's potential there? Do, could you see hydrogen stuff penetrating the bigger truck, the uh, the bigger motorhome markets down the line? I'd be curious to know what you guys think about that. Um, and like I said, had a lot of different things to cover today. Very, uh, well, the one was like four or five topics all interrelated, then a bunch of very unrelated stuff. Some of that very unrelated stuff, I wanna put some, um, some cautionary information out there. Uh, it's no secret, there's a lot of need for service work in the RV industry. I, I wish that wasn't necessarily the case, but unfortunately it is. And it doesn't matter what you own, I've yet to find necessarily a perfect RV, and sometimes, um, you know, you're just at a place like whether you're traveling or you're at a seasonal or permanent site, you can't necessarily just haul it back to the place that you bought it from. The whole reason you get these things is to travel. What I'm getting at here is I, I really want to encourage you to, um, if, if you call that mobile tech who can come out to you and get work done, I really want to encourage you to maybe do some very quick cursory level looking into, is this even an actual legitimate business that you're calling? Um, do they, are they insured if they screwed something up? Uh, do they, are they qualified? Do they have training? Do, are they certified or anything like that? Um, be, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. There's certainly plenty of people far more skilled than me at, at wrenching on things and fixing things. But there's also people who aren't certified for doing that work who are out there working on stuff right now with a nice fancy decal on the side of their service truck um, under the name of a mobile tech. And I also want to be fair. And I want to explain and, and share that, yeah, sometimes there's certain technicians at some dealerships that also need additional training. Uh, I, I get that. But that's one of the benefits of being at a dealership is they have the resources to do that. There are some folks out there who might be doing effectively like unlicensed contractor work. The hiccup, the reason I'm sharing this is if something goes wrong, something goes sideways, and if there's two people pointing fingers at one another, you're gonna be SOL. You're gonna be up that creek without a paddle and you're gonna be footing a second bill uh, for a repair where let's say we screw something up, we stand behind our work, we'll get stuff taken care of. You may not have that that opportunity, that luxury there. I think there's so, there's there's many many awesome, very good mobile service tech people. We actually utilize the services of several local independent service technicians to help our clients. There's some very good people who do some breathtakingly good work out there. People I wish worked for us instead of for themselves. But I, I understand wanting to work for yourself. That is a cute little thing. Anyway, sorry, I get distracted sometimes by the viewfinder. My point is, do some very like. What can you do? What what can you do? How can you check into this? And thankfully, for the most part, I think you can do some very basic things that aren't necessarily a guarantee, but are going to give you a good indicator. Do I get a good feel about this uh, individual or not? Um, step one: Google it. <laughs> you know, Google their business name or what you know whatever operations business they call themselves. See if anything pops up. Do they have their own website? Uh, do they have uh, their own Facebook page? Do they have listings on, on, on pages like that? Now, none of that's necessary. You don't have to have a website. You don't have to have a Facebook page to be a, a legitimate licensed mobile service tech. But I think most of them that are kind of serious about this are going to have at least something that says, hi, my name is so-and-so and I can do mobile work in this kind of area and here's my phone number. Like something basic at least. Um, this is gonna sound funny, but uh, do they have like an actual domain email address or is it like, you know, uh, rickety crickets, uh, camper repairs at yahoo.com. Well, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they, you know, if they're using, uh, or is it, you know, like Tom at rickety crickets RV repair. That's not again, a guarantee. These are some base level indicators that you can check at home to just kind of say like, does this feel legit? Does this feel right? And the best thing I can tell you on this, and this is true whether you're talking about mobile techs, whether you're talking about dealership technicians or dealerships in general or RVs that you're maybe purchasing, trust your gut. I, you're gonna know. You're, you're, you're going to know with a pretty decent level of confidence. Does this smell right or does this smell fishy? And the final bit of news and insight I want to offer you here at the service level. It doesn't sound really RV related. I have a, a tech background, so it's something that kind of caught my interest. And then I realized how very RV related it is. And that is the fact that ransomware is on the rise. Now, ransomware is when 
something, someone, uh, you know, puts a program or something on your computer that basically locks your computer down and says, hey, if you want your computer to start working again, you better send me $200, you know? And uh, you're, you're basically held hostage. Now, um, the reason I think that that is very RV related is more now than ever before in history. Whether people have been priced out of the real estate market, they've looked at an RV as like a residence, or if they're looking at it as a, a mobile workstation or something like that. Um, you know, more RVs are being used like homes now than ever before, as far as I know, in the history of ever. And that trend does not look like it's dying down anytime soon. And the thing is not a lot of people realize how unsecure your information is in a lot of those wild RV environments. And I've talked about this a few times. I, I want to just continue. I, I'm not sponsored by anyone. I don't get paid for saying stuff like this. I don't care who you do it with, but look into things like secure VPNs. Um, if, if you don't know what they are, again, Google it. You don't even necessarily have to understand it, but if you're going to spend a lot of time on the road, if you're doing anything personal, banking data, paying your phone bill, anything like that beyond just generally watching cat videos on TikTok or whatever, or dog videos as I tend to prefer. Cat videos aren't bad, but cat videos are like so 2012 on YouTube. Anyway, you get the idea. My point is, if you're doing anything with any level of personal information on it, you should never do that on any sort of open public source. Like a cellular network is better than nothing. Uh, using a VPN and a cellular network combined is about as good as you can go. And understand, you're never guaranteed 100% threat free, but just don't do things like don't open, don't click on links from email senders that you don't recognize. If they say you owe them money for something, uh, try to contact the company. You know, if it's written in funky English, you're gonna, it's probably not legit. You know what I mean? And if it is important, they'll send you a second notice. And on the topic of internet stuff, I, I know I said the last one was the last thing, but I forgot this is the last thing, unless I remember something else. Anyway, um, if you camp here in the middle of nowhere, which a lot of people like to, you haven't really had a lot of good internet service options out there. Uh, there have been a couple things, but uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I know some people that juggle like three different um, cell cellular hotspots. So depending on where they travel in the country, they can have some variety of internet. And sometimes it's fast and sometimes it's not. And, um, you know, we talked about how, uh, you know, park Wi-Fi is often not safe and it's not usually fast there's too many other people using it you know like you can't stream netflix or something on a lot of that stuff not reliably well spacex has announced a uh, a new total different plan and system for their starlink internet system uh for specific for rvers basically i think it's actually just called starlink for rv i think it's around 135 a month uh, the cool thing about this is unlike the standard Starlink service, you can pause it and resume it when you need to. So if you're traveling sometimes and not others, you can use it when you need to. And basically, as long as you have a clear view of the sky, you can get speeds that are roughly about 10 times faster than what you could get off a cellular service and it's, it's more secure, you know? There's, there's a lot of benefits to it. Now, it's not necessarily foolproof, and one of the interesting things is I actually think it'll be better um, the more remote you are. It actually solves the problem uh, that, that isn't solved yet, but it actually has a, a weakness where everyone else has already solved a problem. If you are surrounded by a bunch of other people who are all using it at the same time in the same area, then you're all sharing one total bandwidth pool and basically your internet might work a little bit slower. So there's times where it's gonna be really awesome. There's times where it might not. But the fact is when you are in the middle of nowhere, there just have not always been good options for mobile work campers, uh, just full-time RVers, travelers, uh, you know, travel nurses, all that kind of stuff. This could be that thing that you've been looking for that the that just hasn't really functionally existed in the RV industry before. Anybody have any experience with this? I know a couple people, uh, just share your thoughts and your, your, your feedback. If you have any knowledge and any experience with this for other people who might be curious. Uh, I know a couple people who have used it and I know a couple people have been near people who have used it and even under some decent tree coverage, even with what reads to be limited reception, they're still getting very fast, reliable service. It is a potential, like I said, game-changing thing for the RV industry that, again, just it's one step closer to, to being always connected.
unless you don't want to be. Then just pull the plug. And folks, once again, thank you so much for tuning in, uh, continuing to watch, continuing to support, share your information. If you appreciate how we as a, pull back the curtain and, and kind of try to give you an insight into the, the, the inner mechanisms as to what's happening in the RV industry, please hit that subscribe button and like our video. And, and let me know what you think, anything I've shared. Um, whether, you know, if something I shared, if you've seen the contrary to it, if you've seen a difference in that regionally, where do you think, uh, you know, what might be the future of electric or hydrogen vehicles for in the RV industry, if any? I'd love to hear what you guys think. And as always, if there's a specific topic or concern like that, uh, that propane regulator thing, if there's something that you need the insights or clarity or transparency on, Leave me a comment, let me know, and I will do my best to fill in those things because you guys always drive this channel. I'll see what I can uh, scrounge up next month. Remember, uh, another reason to subscribe is we do put out those regular recall reports. So not only are we trying to keep you informed, we're trying to keep you safe. Whether you're the first owner or the last owner of that RV, I don't care. I want you to be safe and I want you to be happy and I want you to have a good time. Because it's camping, man. It's supposed to just be about fun. So if that sounds good, We'll see you next time. You take care, stay safe, have fun, and best wishes from Bishes, everyone. Mm -hmm.